Welcome to the 2023 American Academy of Neurology Annual Meeting Top Science Press Conference. The American Academy of Neurology is the world's largest association of neurologists and neuroscience professionals with over 40,000 members. This year, the meeting is being held in Boston and live online April 22nd through the 27th. There will be more than 13,000 attendees from around the world. My name is Andrew M. Holt, and I will be your host this morning. At this year's meeting, more than 2,600 scientific abstracts will be presented by researchers sharing the latest scientific advances in brain disease. You will hear about three of those abstracts today. Thank you, members of the press, for joining us. Today, Dr. Natalia Rost will be presenting her choices for top science. Dr. Rost is the is Chief of the Stroke Division at Massachusetts General Hospital, Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, and Chair of the American Academy of Neurology's Science Committee. It is the AAN Science Committee that oversees the selection of science being presented at the AAN Annual Meeting. Joining her today are three authors of the abstracts Dr. Rost has selected to feature at today's press conference. Dr. Mariana Spatola of the Reagan Institute of Massachusetts General Hospital, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. George Ambathingal of QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute in Queensland, Australia, and Dr. David Spencer of Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. After each author presents their abstract, Dr. Rost will ask the author a few questions. We will then take questions from journalists via the Q&A function. If you would like to ask a question, please post your name and news outlet in the Q&A. We will be calling on reporters. If called upon, we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Please use chat only if you are having technical issues. I would now like to introduce Dr. Natalia Rost, who will make some opening remarks about this year's annual meeting and her selections for top science. Dr. Rost. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our traditional annual top science conference. This year is particularly special to me for a number of reasons, and I'm so glad you have been able to join us to celebrate a platinum jubilee, so to speak, of the AAN science in my own glorious town of Boston. As you know, uh, in just over a week's time, the spacious halls of the Boston Convention and Exhibit Center will be abuzz with more than 13,000 attendees from the US and around the globe. The American Academy of Neurology's 75th annual meeting is officially pushing the records of pre-pandemic registration, including our virtual meeting component for thousands of neurologists, neuroscientists, trainees of every level from high school students to postdoctoral, as well as other professionals and neurology enthusiasts across multiple subspecialties who can't wait to get this party started. And there are many reasons to celebrate. Uh, just to think of the trajectory of the AAN scientific program starting in 1949 from a small meeting in French Lake Springs, Indiana, featuring only 38 papers to the 75th annual meeting program that had to consider over 3000 original abstract submissions, translating into more than 400 scientific platform presentations and more than 2000 posters for you to browse in the new and improved poster neighborhood and online. So as you can see, my task of selecting three abstracts to be considered representative of our 2023 annual meeting breadth and scope of science is not an easy one, especially when it comes to top science. But I consider it a great privilege and also a pure joy in my role as the AAN science chair, and especially this year as my chair term is coming to an end. So for my final top science conference, I selected three papers that to me brought to light some of the key elements both necessary and required to accomplish the ultimate goal of scientific medical research. That is to expand our knowledge in order to bring real change in neurological health in this case, for the benefit of our patients, their families, and the public at large. 
Those of you who are returning to our event, you might remember that I like to select a theme for each of the top science conferences. So today, I would like to propose uh, quintessential neuroscience for the 21st century as the theme that binds the three papers together. And what makes it quintessential for these three papers is the cutting edge innovation at the core of each of these studies, a dedicated pursuit of the neurological disease mechanisms demonstrated in them, their advanced methodology use, and their overarching objective to improve health and alleviate suffering for patients with neurological disorders. So these quintessential characteristics of research projects to be presented today is what, in my opinion, puts them in top science category at this year's A and annual meeting. You will hear today from three distinguished investigators, all experts in their respective fields who are pushing the boundaries of impossible in scientific discovery, whether by bringing hope to patients with nearly uniformly fatal central nervous system infection, or altering the course of disease through novel cell therapy approach and epilepsy, or by unraveling the new mechanisms of brain injury by SARS-CoV-2 virus that remains to be a great threat to brain health for millions of Americans and people worldwide. So with that, I'd like to start the official portion of our program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rost. I would now like to introduce Dr. Rost's first guest, Dr. Mariana Spatola. Dr. Spatola, please turn on your video and audio at this time. Dr. Spatola will present her abstract titled, Serum and Cerebral Spinal Fluid Antibody Signatures Track with Outcome of Neurologic Post-Acute Sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 Infection. This abstract is no longer embargoed. Welcome, Dr. Spatola, and please share with us the summary of the findings of your research. Thank you, thank you so much for this great opportunity to share uh, the results of my result of my abstract. In this, uh, so this abstract is about the delayed neurological complications of the infection by the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes uh, coronavirus disease 19 or COVID-19. Um, the new, these neurological complications include confusion, cognitive disturbances, headache, and even encephalitis. And these appear at distance from the initial respiratory disease as part of what is known as long COVID or neurological post-acute sequelae of COVID or neuropask, as I will call it from now on. Why some individuals develop neuropask is still unknown, but increasing evidence uh, has pointed to a, a role for the immune system rather than the virus itself. So in this study, we focused on a specific part of the immune system, which are the antibodies, and explored the, their role in the development of neuropask. Here, in particular, we studied the antibody response uh, in more than 100 individuals with SARS-CoV-2 infection who either developed or did not develop neuropask. In particular, we were interested in the antibody responses, not only against SARS-CoV-2, but also against other uh, um, coronaviruses that are the cause of the common cold and that the majority of the population um, has encountered in their uh, lives. So what we observed is that compared to individuals who did not develop neurological complications, those with neuropask exhibited attenuated responses against SARS-CoV-2, but surprisingly showed significantly expanded antibody responses against other coronaviruses. So this observation suggests uh, to me a very interesting uh, mechanism that is called original antigenic scene or immunologic imprinting, uh, in which basically pre-existing uh, antibody responses against related viruses um, can shape the antibody response against the current infection and then can also prevent the full maturations of these antibody responses against the current virus. In other words, we can say that um, people with neuropask and even more those who uh, had a poor outcome, so with incomplete recovery from their neurological symptoms, showed an activation of these old responses against common coronaviruses. So these common coronaviruses are pretty similar to SARS-CoV-2, but they are not exactly the same. So this means that these increased antibody responses were not uh, specifically um, 
specific to SARS-CoV-2. And so they were probably less efficient to control the virus. And also they, this can lead to persistent of inflammation that is somehow um, off target. And uh, for example, if this happens within the brain, uh, this can lead to neuroinflammation uh, then that, that can be by itself uh, detrimental and that can cause neurological dysfunction and so neurological symptoms. So taken together, these findings suggest a possible pathogenic mechanism that can contribute to the development of neurological complications after SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection and also can suggest some interesting um, targets for um, developing new therapeutic strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Spatola. Um, very interesting uh, data that you're presenting. I fully realize that sample size of the patients that you've been working with is still very small, uh, including particularly those patients who were diagnosed with neuropask. And it's clearly the definition of neuropask is evolving. Uh, I'm assuming that in your study, but I would like you to clarify, this was mostly based on the clinical criteria. And uh, I, I'm assuming that you anticipate the definition of neuropask will be evolving and potentially using some of the biomarkers that can be confirming or disconfirming uh, the, that particular diagnosis. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. So um, that's true that uh, over the time, since the beginning of the pandemics, this concept of neuropask has been evolving. In this um, study, we were very keen on trying to uh, get a most uniform as possible uh, population. So we really uh, considered people who had um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, demonstrated by um, nasal swab, so positive PCR. Uh, with nasal swab in both for those uh, who uh, had neuropask and those who did not have neuropask. Um, and also we confirmed uh, with the uh, uh, serology, positive serology for SARS-CoV-2. So we really wanted to have a clear cut idea that these people had been infected with the, specifically with, with SARS-CoV-2. And uh, as you were saying, um, the neurological complications, uh, the, what we understand from this neurological complication has been evolving over the, over the time. And we know that um, there are some acute um, neurological complications and these are nowadays not considered as the neuropask, the delayed or late onset um, neuropask. And these are really different uh, types of um, uh, neurological symptoms that go from uh, stroke to um, uh, other types of more acute uh, neurological dysfunction. Whereas uh, those that I have been uh, analyzing here are really uh, patients with uh, encephalopathy. So who have um, uh, more uh, of a confusion or a persistent headache, uh, cognitive dysfunction and this type of, um, of symptoms. So these are really two separate um, scenarios. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that as the definition evolves uh, um, with growing understanding of the mechanisms. Well, I, one of the uh, most intriguing um, conclusions and also findings within your work is actually that definition of the uh, original antigenic sin uh, in relation to the uh, COVID-19 virus, which is uh, something new I've learned. Um, and I wanted to ask you, this is obviously fascinating. I think it has to be further developed, but I wanted to ask you whether uh, this is a phenomenon that has been seen with other uh, viruses that have, um, you know, historically affected central nervous system, created some sort of a delayed uh, sequela of exposures. And if, if that's the case, what kind of viruses uh, that have shown this original antigenic uh, sin? And, you know, what have we learned from those viruses that we can apply in a COVID-19 uh, neuropask scenario? Yeah, that's uh, that's a very good question. So the 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 idea of this uh, original antigenic scene is not something uh, specific or unique to to SARS-CoV-2. Indeed, it has been um, it is a, a concept that is relatively um, known in the field of vaccinology. Uh, for example, um, those who have been working in trying to find uh, the best uh, vaccine for the flu. Uh, virus or for HIV uh, know that uh, it is very hard to um, to find uh, the, the the perfect vaccine that can act 
and be uh, protective for uh, all these different types for, for the virus that has been that, that evolves over time. And so basically what has been seen, for example, for HIV is that uh, if people get infected with the first strain of HIV, uh, the first immune response against this HIV uh, will somehow be um, um, influence the future responses even to a vaccine or to a therapeutic vaccine over time. And so this is something that we, we, we really know that it can, um, so the, the, the initial response to a, to a certain virus uh, can really um, uh, shape or uh, prevent the full maturation uh, of the antibody response against the, uh, against the vaccine even. So it is something really that um, has been uh, very interesting for me to discover in the, in the field of vaccinology and that I was really excited to find it as a mechanism also for, um, for SARS-CoV-2. Great, thank you. I'll ask you a very quick question and so then we can move on to the questions from the uh, journalist. I can see already uh, some indications in the chat that uh, they're eager to ask you. Uh, some follow-ups. Uh, with regard to the uh, good and bad outcome in this particular study, what was the duration of observation where you actually noted the uh, good or bad outcome? And what are we looking at in terms of learning from this mechanism on how long we should be monitoring these patients with neuropask uh, for recovery or potential deterioration? Yeah, that's that's a, a very good question, and I think that uh, there's not a, a uniform answer for the different studies uh, that have been um, published. In my case, so we studied um, patients who developed the neuropask symptoms around two to four months after the initial respiratory disease, and then we followed up them up uh, between uh, six and eight months. Uh, so the good or poor um, outcome has been determined at the last follow-up, so between six and eight months. Um, I think that this is probably a short follow-up. So uh, what we have been seeing in the clinic is that patients still go on uh, improving over time, also after this, um, this time. So um, probably future studies should really address longer uh, term outcome for, for these patients. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn over to the uh, journalists. Thank you, Dr. Roast and Dr. Spatola. We will now take questions from journalists. Renee? Yes, thanks, Andy. Journalists, if you would like to ask your question, please post your name and publication in the Q&A. If we call on you, um, we will receive an, you will receive a notification to unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. While your video will not be activated, the audio of your voice will be live. Ted Bosworth of Neurology Reviews, you may unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, yeah, I uh, just want to know what the, um, if you could speculate about the clinical implications of the research or whether a clinical neurologist might be able to diagnose neuropask uh, through uh, the anti antibody profile or some other way, which might be helpful to patients to at least know what the cause of their symptoms is, and also how you think this is going to lead to uh, their, or if it's going to lead to uh, therapeutic targets. Um, yes, yeah, so the the diagnosis of neuropaths is um, for for the neurologist is mainly um, clinical. is firstly clinical, so it's really this appearance of neurological uh, symptoms uh, after the um, after a certain delay uh, from from the um, respiratory disease. However, of course, we are trying to find uh, biomarkers to 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 say that these new neurological symptoms are related to. Um, uh, to the infection. And so what, um, what my study has tried to find is really um, uh, trying to find signatures of antibodies uh, that can um, mark the, uh, the differences in those patients who are developing neuropask. Uh, now, whether this is um, something that is going to be um, uh, rapidly put into the uh, diagnostic path is probably uh, not the case, not yet at least, because um, for now, uh, the signatures that I've been looking for are um, uh, analyzing uh, like 150 different features uh, from uh, antibodies from these patients, um, and uh, the techniques I don't think is uh, are, are yet to be um, used in the in the um, uh, in the diagnostic clinic. 
And regarding the uh, opportunities for future therapies, I think that um, better understanding of the mechanism is really the first thing that we uh, need to, um, uh, to get uh, to, to, to understand uh, and, and, and find new targets. In the case of my study, I would say that the fact that we know and, and I've seen that certain uh, features of the antibodies are associated with the uh, worse outcome um, uh, are um, very useful to try to understand where, where we should, uh, how to target these neuropaths can improve um, the uh, patient's outcome. In particular, for example, since we have seen that um, those with poor outcome have an increased response against other common coronaviruses and the decreased response to SARS-CoV-2 specifically, we might think that boosting the um, uh, the antibody response specifically to SARS-CoV-2 uh, might uh, improve the outcome of these patients or might even prevent the development of uh, neuropask. Thank you, Ted, for asking your question. Uh, I would now like to call on Isabella Chicon. Isabella with uh, Neurology Live, you may unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, um, I also put this in the chat as well, but I wanted to know a little bit more about the implications of these findings in terms of potential treatments, which I know you covered a little bit, but also what about preventative approaches for patients as well? Uh, sorry, I didn't get, what about the, the, the last part? Which approach for the patient? Preventative, preventative. preventative. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't think it, I, I didn't go into the details, but part of my study was also about uh, trying to characterize the differences of these antibody signatures between the blood circulation and the uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, circulation. So basically what I've been uh, able, I was able to see is that antibodies within the brain are uh, functionally different. So they are able to activate uh, certain specific uh, functions of the uh, innate immune system. And for example, uh, I've seen that antibodies within the brain uh, were mostly um, capable to activate phagocytosis, which is one of those uh, functions from the innate immune system. So basically, uh, one uh, opportunity would, might be, for example, to try to um, uh, engineer antibodies as therapeutics uh, using some mutations that are known, that are already known, uh, that might um, promote or modulate, for example, the phagocytosis uh, of these uh, within the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid. So basically, um, the idea would be to modify antibodies as um, new um, uh, therapeutics that might cross the blood band barrier and enter the brain to uh, really try to modulate those. Uh, features of the antibodies and those uh, um, arms of the innate immune system that are associated with better outcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, journalists. If uh, anybody else has questions either during the press conference or after, feel free to put them in the Q&A or email our team and we will make sure that Dr. Spatola gets your questions so that she can provide you with responses. Thank you. We will now move on to the next presenter. I would now like to introduce Dr. Rose's second guest, Dr. George Ambalathingal. Dr. Ambalathingal, you may now turn on your video and audio. Dr. Ambalathingal will speak about his abstract titled ce VST01-JC, a novel allogenic T-cell-based immunotherapy for the treatment of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Dr. Ambla Thingall, welcome. Please share with us a summary of the findings of your research. Thank you, Dr. Rost, and uh, thank you, Dr. Imhol. It's an absolute pleasure to share about a project on uh, T-cell therapy for um, PML, uh, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. In short, we call it as PML. Um, I'll, I'll roughly start with a brief introduction about the disease itself, where it's very critical to know about the disease first. So PML is a rare and often a fatal disease caused by JC polyoma virus, which affects the brain and nervous system. Um, PML primarily occurs in people who are profoundly immunosuppressed, uh, such as those with uh, HIV, AIDS, certain cancers, autoimmune diseases such as uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, 
uh, and also those who have received specific uh, immune suppressive therapy, uh, such as post-transplantation. The major problem is that there is no specific treatment for PML. And the management typically involves um, supportive care and immune system restoration, only only if there is possible to re restore the immune system. But over the last decade, uh, T cell therapy has shown really promising results uh, for the treatment of PML. However, um, there have only been very limited clinical trials um, and case studies conducted on adoptive T cell therapy for PML. Hence, uh, we at QIMR and Cell Evolve has developed a next generation off the shelf JC's polyomavirus specific T cell product, uh, which can be used to treat uh, the patients with PML. The, this is basically a third party T cell product, uh, which is manufactured and characterized uh, using a proprietary JC polyoma virus specific peptide platform. The platform is uh, very simple. It is uh, a highly curated uh, mixture of 36 immunogenic JC polyoma specific peptides covering all the antigens of JC virus um, that are used to enrich, expand, and also characterize the T cells, uh, which we manufacture and store in a bank and provide to the patients as and when required. Um, our preclinical studies have really shown excellent results with high specificity and potency for JCV. Um, we recently uh, received an IND clearance from F FDA to conduct a phase to pivotal clinical trial, which we are calling it as SNJC. Uh, this will be the largest clinical trial till date to assess the safety and efficacy of any therapy for PML. Uh, this will be led by Dr. Irene Cortese from NIH. And this will be a multi-center clinical trial involving up to 60 PML uh, patients. Uh, with this trial, what we are hoping is that we can gain key knowledge about uh, uh, the efficacy, safety, and the time uh, of disease progression um, uh, in the uh, PML patients and also the overall survival. Um, while uh, this trial is uh, um, about to start, we have also provided these cells on a compassionate basis uh, to patients who are absolutely in uh, need. And uh, the, uh, we have seen very promising uh, safety and efficacy results in these patients who have a very strong JCV reactivation. Uh, we are very hopeful that we will replicate these results in our trial and the trial will sh uh, open shortly in US. I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ambalathingal. Um, I wanted to let you know as a neurologist, there are a few diagnoses in our clinics that we dread. And the diagnosis of PML is one of them for sure, because it almost uniformly signals uh, unrelenting uh, disease progression in, uh, in majority of patients, as you said, fatal outcomes. So I wanted to commend you and your colleagues uh, working on this very important problem. And you know, one of my first questions to you is that, uh, why wasn't it available until now? The question being centered around particular advances that currently allow us, you know, what has changed in the methodology, understanding, and a kind of critical base of knowledge for us to be able to proceed that way? So if you could highlight that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, as um, you mentioned, it is a very, this disease is very progressive in nature. Uh, basically, um, if you think about the small, when I mentioned about these small studies, most of them was done using an autologous therapy where they take the T cells, uh, the, the peripheral blood cells from the patient and then enrich them and then put it back to the patient. The problem is um, it takes almost 20 to 30 days to grow these T cells and also to uh, characterize them and then to inject into the patient. So uh, by the time you manufacture your teasers and put it into the patient, the, 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 the disease just progresses very drastically. And uh, that's where uh, we, we have come up with a third party system where we are trying to develop a T cell therapy where we take cells from you and me. And then because we are all positive for JC virus, uh, we enrich these cells and expand them and store it in a bank. So it's easy, and we are hoping to provide uh, to, uh, these cells to the patient as quickly as possible. So this is, uh, I hope I have addressed your question. Yeah, for sure. And uh, um, since the um, 
it, it appears that immunotherapy itself is going to be administered intravenously. Uh, how do you um, uh, anticipate any challenges that may be related to, you know, CNS penetration, uh, getting getting the uh, T cells to where they are supposed to be? Uh, this is um, actually um, our previous experience. Uh, we have tried with CMV, the specific T cells to treat GBM. We have not seen any issues with. Uh, there is always a debate between cells crossing a, uh, how well the cells cross between the blood brain barrier or reach the site of action. Uh, but we have seen that CMV specific cells, which we have grown, were able to um, um, be located in the brain and they were able to clear the CMV. So it is exactly the same mechanism. So, and also um, these T cells have certain markers which drives them towards the, um, uh, the, uh, the brain barrier as well. So uh, I think with our experience, see previous experience with CMV specific T cells, we haven't seen that uh, issue. So we don't think we, uh, this is going to be an issue. But the, uh, as I said, the previous experiences also have shown that the cells were successfully found in the CNS after treatment. Yeah. So that, that's very encouraging. And there is um, and uh, there is always this debate that whether the cells can reach the site of action, which is brain is always a tough area for the cells to reach and stuff but uh, we are very we are we are we, we are very confident about this yeah. confidence in science is a great uh, quality it carries you forward it also gives you lessons to learn uh, but i wanted to ask you um with regard to potentially uh, i'm assuming that uh, you know for those patients who are going to progress despite the treatment and even if you were giving the cells for compassionate uh, use you perhaps arranging for a, a brain autopsy uh, you know to learn from the tissues uh, and you know carry that knowledge forward yeah so yes, we we are uh, we do a thorough uh, characterization of the, the, the complete uh, brain uh, mapping where we are checking for the T2 uh, flare um, and the lesions. How well how um, how how the lesions are progressing or how well, how it is um, is controlled. Uh, with our previous uh, recently, we had a case where uh, we provided the cells and then the the clinician just came back to us and said. Uh, we have never seen this. The lesions are completely stopped, but the uh, the uh, the disease progression has been so fast, and the cells were able to control these lesions. And we are planning to completely uh, assess and analyze everything. That's what our trial is focusing on. We want to also study what is the mechanism and science behind uh, what is happening uh, in the brain um, with respect to when you inject these T cells. So that is also part of our clinical to understand the basic science behind it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll ask one question and then pass off to the journalists because I can see that they are already putting questions in the chat. Uh, my final question to you is, you know, patients with PML, as you already uh, implied, uh, most of the time they have dysregulated immune system, whether they're immunocompromised or they've been treated with, uh, you know, immunomodulators that actually artificially kind of shifted the environment, uh, immunologic environment in the body. Uh, and I'm assuming you're going to be testing these under different conditions in different patient populations that ultimately develop PML and whether you anticipate any challenges related to this kind of, you know, uh, immune responses that go on astray, so to speak. Absolutely. Each patient is different and how their immune system performs is different. And always there is going to be this because innately their immune system is suppressed. That's why JCV reactivation is so strong. So uh, it is going to be a little more challenging case to case. We are planning to assess it. And uh, in the meantime, um, um, if possible, we could reduce the immunosuppressive regimens we will do. And again, as I said, Dr. Irene Cotisi will be the clinical uh, coordinator. I am more of a research. So in the clinical side, she will, uh, I think uh, um, the, she and her team will assess thoroughly and get to it. Thank you. Congratulations again. And Andy, we're ready to pass off to the journalists. Thank you, Dr. Rost. And thank you, Dr. Amala Thingal. We'll now take questions from journalists. Renee? Journalists, to ask your questions, please post your name and news outlet in the Q&A. If we call on you, please unmute yourself to ask your question. I do see that Kelly Whitlock Burton from Medscape Medical News has posted a question and her microphone is not working. So I will read her question for you. Uh, Kelly asks, 
Did I understand correctly that some patients have used the therapy through the Compassionate Use Program? If so, how many, how long have they used it, and what results have been recorded? Okay. So when I talk about the compassionate use, according to the ethics in Australia, we are not allowed to gather a lot more data. Like we cannot access the um, uh, the CNS and stuff. But but the clinicians do uh, the the scanning of the brain and they report us uh, report back to us. Uh, what uh, we have done so far is we have treated three patients, um, um, of which um, all three of them showed partial uh, responses. So while well, one of the patient was really in a progressed state, um, the, uh, that patient had uh, recovered her uh, eye vision, but the disease was in a later stage, um, then the uh, patient succumbed to the disease. The second patient we treated, uh, we provided, we, all of these patients got about six doses of our uh, T-cells um, uh, with a two weeks uh, pe interlock period. And, uh, uh, the second patient was very interesting. The clinician came back to us and said she has radio. Uh, the radiologically she is stable. That means her lesions has not progressed. The T two flares um, has not come up. New lesions has not come up. That means the and also the viral load of JC virus has gone down. Uh, so the, that is an indication that the T cells has worked. So that's why. And third patient is similar. Her, uh, the 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 patients. Um, T2 flare again, uh, the lesions did not come up. New lesions did not come up. This was the so far the findings with our, our, our uh, products. Thank you, Dr. Ambala Thingal. Um, at this time, we don't have any other questions uh, in the Q&A. So um, journalists, if you do have other questions uh, for Dr. Ambala Thingal, please feel free to put them in the Q&A today and we can forward them to him or you can also email them to our team and we will make sure to get responses. Thank you, Dr. Ambala Thingal. Uh, we will now move on to the next presenter. I would now like to introduce our third guest, Dr. David Spencer. Dr. Spencer, you may now turn on your video and audio. Dr. Spencer will speak about his abstract titled First Inhuman Trial of NRTX-1001 GABAergic Interneuron Cell Therapy for Treatment of Focal Epilepsy, Emerging Clinical Trial Results. Please note that this abstract is emerging science and is embargoed until 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time, Friday, April 21st. Please do not publish stories on this research until the embargo lifts. Hello, Dr. Spencer. Please share with us a summary of the findings of your research. Thank you, Andrew and Dr. Rost for the invitation. I'm pleased to discuss this work on behalf of a very large group, uh, including uh, Dr. Robert Beach from SUNY Upstate New York, who's actually the lead author, but unfortunately was not able to be here today. Also on behalf of my team at OHSU and the team at Neurona Therapeutics who sponsored the study. Uh, so just by way of brief background, epilepsy is a very common condition. It affects about three and a half million people in the United States. About uh, the, the epilepsy can arise from many different causes, but fundamentally it arises from an imbalance between inhibition and excitation in the brain. About two thirds of people with epilepsy get good control of their seizures using anti seizure medication. And for those who don't, identifying the seizure focus and removing it surgically can often result in seizure freedom in a high proportion of patients. Unfortunately, not all patients are candidates for epilepsy surgery, and for those who are, the surgery itself carries some risks, including to cognition and to memory. So our work is studying the possibility of boosting inhibition in the seizure focus using implanted human inhibitory neurons. Now, preclinical work in animal models of epilepsy has provided a lot of support for both the safety and the efficacy of this approach. And uh, our work that we're presenting at the annual meeting is early results from a first in human study of implanted human stem cell derived inhibitory neurons in patients with drug resistant epilepsy. The cells were implanted into the seizure focus uh, using in the operating room using MRI guidance through a tiny opening in the back of the skull. The patients were allowed to recover overnight and went home the next day. Our first uh, 
participant who was implanted in New York, had a nine-year history of drug-resistant epilepsy. They were averaging 32 focal seizures uh, per month at baseline. Testing confirmed that seizures were coming from a single focus in the right temporal lobe, and the implant was uncomplicated, and the cells were delivered to the seizure focus on target. To date, there have been no serious or unexpected uh, adverse events from the implant, and at eight months of follow-up, the patient has had a 93% reduction in seizures overall, and is actually free of all seizures causing impairment of awareness, which was the most debilitating seizure type for this patient. Studies of brain metabolism in the area of the implant have shown favorable markers of increased inhibition and decreased inflammation. And cognitive testing the six months showed no worsening of memory function or cognition. And in fact, at least in this one patient, they showed some mild improvements. Our second participant was implanted at OHSU last fall. This uh, patient had an eight-year history of drug-resistant epilepsy and averaged 14 focal seizures per month at baseline. Testing also confirmed seizure onset in a single focus in the right temporal lobe, and the cells were again implanted without complication on target. And to date, the uh, patient has had a 94% reduction in seizures and no serious adverse events. So we're very excited by this approach that uh, is potentially restorative instead of des destructive like epilepsy surgery. And while these are still early days, we're encouraged by the positive safety findings so far and intrigued by some of these early seizure responses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. Um, this is a true example of emerging science at the Academy of Neurology. It's literally hot off the press. I'm, uh, very excited to see preliminary uh, results, but, uh, you know, very promising ones. And I also feel that the type of a therapy that's being offered, the cell therapy, the implant is uh, something that's very novel and representative of where the field is moving when there are no traditional solutions uh, for the, uh, you know, common neurological problems that exist. So, you know, congratulations uh, to your entire team. I wanted to start by asking, and I think that maybe just to clarify for the uh, journalists, but also for someone who is not an expert in epilepsy, I'm a stroke doctor. So just to confirm that this type of patient population you're talking about really truly do not have uh, other surgical options because when, uh, you know, when, when we hear temporal lobe epilepsy, we frequently uh, think of an epilepsy that is amendable to other surgical options that have been available, uh, uh, you know, throughout the, you know, decades now? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's a tricky situation because I think scientifically, um, the, the goal was to start with a patient population who has a very well-defined epilepsy where the seizure focus is well-defined and can be targeted with the cell therapy. Uh, it does overlap in this case with some patients who are actually candidates for surgery. In fact, uh, most of them are candidates for surgery as an alternative approach. So it's trying to find that balance or clinical equipoise between uh, you know, going forward with a existing therapy, which is tissue destructive versus an experimental therapy, which is uh, potentially restorative. So it's... Um, you know, it, it, it brings up some challenging questions. One of the, one of the positive things actually though, uh, hidden in that is that patients uh, who potentially if they do not have a good outcome or adequate response to cell therapy, they can still go forward uh, with a resective epilepsy surgery in the future. So it doesn't preclude uh, using a, you know, a standard or approved therapy uh, in the future. Very interesting. Um, one other, uh, you know, kind of a natural uh, extension of, you know, uh, the line of thinking with uh, cell implants in the brain is obviously, A, you see uh, early response, successful response to, uh, you know, particular, um, you know, cell subtype. In this case, it's uh, GABAergic interneurons, uh, you know, so uh, how do you, you know, explain uh, such an early response, you know, does it take time for, you know, for things to sort of to settle, so to speak, after the surgery? And B, obviously, what's the trajectory of the cell population? Is there data that shows that, you know, survivability uh, of those uh, implanted cells 
you know, is something that's promising? Are they going to regenerate and just kind of self-perpetuate as a population? Or you expect, you know, you're anticipating uh, uh, attrition of the response over time and how long that may be? Those are both great questions and right on, right on target, I think. Uh, we were a little surprised by the early responses that we were seeing in these two patients that have undergone the implant so far. The preclinical work in animal models, predominantly in rodent models, um, has suggested that it may take typically four to six months for the cells to fully um, move or migrate into optimal position and actually integrate and form circuits with the other cells in the temporal lobe, in this case, in the hippocampus part of the temporal lobe. So we were not anticipating uh, seeing significant responses until perhaps four to six months. So seeing these early responses, uh, while encouraging, I think uh, we have to approach cautiously. There could be uh, just some implant effect that could be transient, um, but, um, but, but nonetheless is encouraging. Um, in terms of survivability of the implanted cells, the uh, animal studies to date uh, have shown good integration into the existing circuits in the brain and good survivability. The, some of the uh, studies in uh, rodents have been carried out at least to one year, showing good viability and survivability of the cells. Um, at, the, uh, at our site at the Oregon Primate Center, uh, we did, just prior to this human study, we did implants into non-human primates, and that also showed good evidence of uh, integration and survivability of the cells. So uh, we don't have long, long-term data, but uh, everything we've seen so far looks encouraging. Well, we'll be monitoring that with, uh, you know, with excitement and, uh, you know, keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, it's an important uh, problem to solve that you're working on. I'll ask one quick question and then I'll pass off to the journalists because I see quite a bit of an activity in the chat. My quick question is uh, with regard to accessibility to this potential treatment. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is going to be uh, more of a specialized centers that will be able to provide this type of therapy. Uh, and, you know, considering the patient selection for treatments, et cetera, do you already begin thinking with your colleagues with regard to how to organize access or will it be just trailing the pathways that we have existing uh, in the, you know, surgical options for epilepsy that's already in place? Great question. Always good to think ahead. I think that's uh, looking a ways into the future at this point. Um, one comment I would make, though, is that um, in contrast to some of the early studies, for example, using uh, fetal tissue implants in Parkinson's disease, um, the technology is, is different here. So these are cells that are actually maintained in cell culture and can be expanded and, um, and preserved. And uh, so distribution of the cells and availability of cells uh, should not be a limiting factor. The technology for the implant is very similar to what functional neurosurgeons are using across the country for uh, either implanting uh, electrodes or doing uh, laser ablation therapies. Um, so the, there's an existing uh, experience and uh, technology to deliver the cells. So um, I think the big limiting factor at this point is uh, is, is data to show that this is a truly a successful approach, uh, but much of the infrastructure should be there. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're ready to pass off to the journalist, Andy, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rost and Dr. Spencer. Again, please note that Dr. Spencer's abstract is embargoed until 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time, Friday, April 21st, 2023. We will now take questions from journalists in the Q&A. Renee? Journalists, please post your name and news outlet in the Q&A, and if we call on you, please unmute yourself to ask your question. David Levine with A Proto Life, you may unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, thank you. So <clears throat> my question is, who are the best candidates for this therapy and who are not? Great question, David. Uh, at this point, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are studying a very specific population of patients who have a single seizure focus in the temporal lobe, in, in the hippocampus, even in a, a particular section of the temporal lobe, uh, in order to um, you know, have a defined structure, a defined uh, target for the cells, 
and um, a relatively uniform population of people to, to study the effects in. Um, if it proves to be effective, then I think that the indications could be expanded. And in, in many respects, the ideal candidates are really perhaps uh, patients who at the moment are not good candidates for resective epilepsy surgery. Uh, perhaps uh, they have a more widespread focus. Perhaps they've had surgery and has been unsuccessful. Perhaps they have more than one focus in the brain. So there may be a, a much broader range of patients who might benefit from this therapy. But in general, it's going to be patients who are not responding to conventional medical therapy uh, and are having ongoing seizures and the, the problems that are uh, carried along with that uh, in that population. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. Um, our next uh, journalist, uh, Megan Brooks with Medscape, her microphone is not working, so she has one question. She's asked, just wondering when when more data points are they coming? When are more data points coming in? Good question. We are, uh, of course, excited to get results in as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, pace of the study was was predetermined um, as is very appropriate here. Uh, safety is the primary focus in these initial patients. So after the first implant, there was a mandated waiting period, uh, review of multiple safety measures and review by a committee to ensure that uh, safety data look good before going on to the second subject. Um, and uh, so now we are in a phase where uh, uh, we're anticipating three additional patients uh, receiving cell implants um, and then a second stage of the safety data with five additional uh, participants uh, receiving probably larger doses of cell implants. Um, with careful safety review all along the way. It will then move into a second stage of study, which looks at both safety and efficacy. So it's a, a larger population of people then, uh, but we're anticipating this is gonna be rolling out over the next several years. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. Uh, Kelly Young from the NEJM group, you may unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you. Um, could you get a little bit more into the, the mechanism here? What's what's happening when, when you inject these? Good question, Kelly. Uh, so the, you know, on a simplistic level, I think the idea is uh, just boosting inhibition. If I uh, introduce this concept of an imbalance between excitation and inhibition in the brain, too much excitation or not enough inhibition causing the brain to tip over into a hyperexcitable or seizure state. So at, at its simplest level, this is you know, installing cells that are producing uh, GABA, which is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, and trying to reset the, the tone essentially in, in the seizure focus, uh, making it less excitable, less likely to tip over into seizures. That may, that may be the primary mechanism. I think more work still needs to be done into how it influences how, how uh, implant of these cells and integration of the cells into the circuits actually influences uh, other aspects of the circuitry in that area. So uh, just increasing inhibition may be a little simplistic and there may be other uh, influences on the, the local milieu that, that um, um, inhibit or reduce some of the pathological responses that happen, for example, after uh, a severe injury to the brain um, and some of the uh, some of the responses of other cells in the area. Uh, but certainly uh, the primary mechanism we think is is just increasing inhibition in that area. Okay, thank you, Dr. Spencer. Um, there are no more questions, so I, I would like to thank you for uh, sharing your research with us today. For those who have additional questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A, and we will get them to Dr. Spencer for responses. You can also email them to us after the press conference. Dr. Rost, would you like to share any closing remarks? 
Thank you, Andy. Um, I think I'm always surprised how time flies when we're having these conferences and, and we are almost uh, uh, out of time. I really hope that you enjoyed our uh, top science conference as much as I did. We could have talked for much longer and enjoyed the conversation with the presenters. I would like to thank the presenters and to all of you uh, for your continuous interest in the AAN science and uh, just uh, again highlight uh, that these are truly the examples of the cutting edge neuroscience at the 2023 AAN annual meeting. And also the reason for us to hope that the future of neurology is bright. Uh, and I hope that you have a opportunity to explore more of the scope and the breadth of the AAN scientific program at the upcoming meeting. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in Boston next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rost. Another wonderful themed top science press conference. Journalists, if you still have questions for authors, please email our AAN annual meeting press room team, Renee Tessman and Natalie Conrad at the email addresses shown on the screen. We also encourage you to register to attend the AAN annual meeting in person or remotely. Press registration closes this Friday, April 14th. Details can be found on aan.com slash pressroom. On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, I would like to thank Dr. Rost, as well as Dr. Spatola, Dr. Ambala Thingal, and Dr. Spencer for sharing their research today. And thank you journalists for attending the AAN Top Science Press Conference.